we're going to talk about what our species is continuing what we ended last class with, and then next class we start into how do you get separate species. The reason I think this is exciting partly is historical, because what was the name of Charles Darwin's book? 1859, The Origin of Species. So this is a question that's been around since the time of the father of modern evolution. And yet it's something that's really difficult to study. So we start with definitions of species. And these are some of the questions that both your textbook has gone through, so hopefully all of you have read the relevant parts of the chapter. But if not, these are some of the main questions that we deal with when we just talk about what are species, then we'll get into how species form after this. So a really critical question is, is a species sort of a fictional thing that we invented, or are they real? Like, is a species a real thing? Or is it just something that we linguistically invented? What do you think? Is a species an actual? What do you need to answer that question? Is the... Yeah, I know. Do species really exist? Or are they a figment of our imagination? I think it was a way for us maybe to like start at some starting place to be able to figure out what things are. So we had to kind of like at least come up with something. So I, I have a feeling it's something that we came up with to help us differentiate between things. Human tendency to organize and categorize and. Put them in little discrete boxes. Right. I agree. So, okay, so the, if, if, if that's the case, then that's easy for things like you go to the Chaffee Zoo and there's zebras and giraffes. And they're totally distinct, and you can tell them apart. But then there are some gray areas, and that's what species concepts are all about. So are species real? We can talk about a couple of ways, at least one way, that scientists have tried to figure out, is it a real thing, or is it just something that we invented linguistically? There are lots of definitions of species. There are lots of ways that scientists define what a species is, and one of the reasons that this is important is that people get really confused when they're talking to each other about species when they don't first define what species concept or definition they're using. So a lot of biological arguments, debates, rifts, focus on, wait a second, what are you talking about when you say you're working with two different species? Because I would consider those two different populations, and then people get really strangely into this sort of argument. And I don't think it's ever come to blows necessarily, but sometimes close. Okay. This is my own personal perspective on the issue. We used to have, we still do, have Linnaean classification, right? House, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. That's pretty easy. Seven different levels of taxonomy. But if you go to what you can't see here, with a Wikipedia entry on Linnaean taxonomy, this is from a few years ago, so it might be even bigger now. I'm just showing this on the left is a screenshot of the whole list of levels. No longer seven. It's like 50 different levels of taxonomy. So different 70, 50, something like that, different terms. All right, so let's see. If I use my super site, that term right there is class. So kingdom, phylum, class. So what's the next one down? Order. That shows up there. So between those two adjacent levels of Linnaean taxonomy, now there are like 15 different terms in between them that people use to divide and subdivide and subdivide to categorize the thousands and tens of thousands of hundreds of thousands of species that we have. Isn't this kind of crazy? I mean, how useful is this? How do you define, in other words, what I'd love to ask, I'm not a taxonomist. Has anybody taken any taxonomy class? So a few of you. Do you discuss what it means to be a particular class of plant or insect versus an order? Like what sort of traits are important? I wouldn't know anything about that, but if I were to guess. Please. Sure. Similarity between okay, so if we, if we assume, for example, it's the number of leaves or the shape of leaves that defines, say, a family arbitrarily, 
Wait a second. Oh, I gave it away. I said arbitrarily. Doesn't it seem sort of arbitrary? Sorry, loaded question. Don't just nod and say yes. You can have your own opinion, of course. But you know, who's to say what defines a giga order? And how does a giga order differ from an infra cohort? So it's all these arbitrary levels of division among species that we've come up with. And that started with Linnaean taxonomy in seven divisions. But of course, the more species were described, the more layers of organization we had to add to be able to classify, organize all of this taxonomy. It's crazy. And so then along comes the patron saint, essentially, of speciation. And look what he says. Does this sound like something that you would expect to see written in a book on the origin of species? No. Totally arbitrary, says Darwin, what some people call different species and what other people call different species. So we have numerous terms. What other terms have you heard for levels of organization beneath species? So within a species. Subfamilies. So subfamilies. Ah, in viruses. Wait a second, we've already got family as part of Linnaean taxonomy, so that sounds kind of redundant. Has anybody heard other terms used for b uh, below species? So you could subspecies. Oftentimes we just talk about populations. This population, that population. So how are we going to define all of these terms? We're not going to come to an answer to all of this. I'm just trying to really motivate the question of how we define species is quite important. Darwin again. In the book on the origin of species, how species form, basically admits, look what he says. About genera, so right, the level up from species. They're merely artificial combinations made for convenience. But we'll be freed from the vain search for the undiscovered and undiscoverable essence of the term species. So he's already given up on finding species. And this was, you know, over a century ago. So this motivated a lot of the subsequent work to try to really carefully define what species are. So in nature, do organisms really exist in species? This is the basis for one of the more important species concepts. There are numbers of species concepts, definitions of species. Do species really organize themselves as species in nature? So one of the approaches that you could do to test this, which is one that was actually conducted, was to ask, do different human groups that don't share similar biases still recognize the same divisions among organisms in nature? So do Western Europeans, if they travel to Australia, observe and define different groups of organisms as different species the same way that aboriginals might? So, that might suggest if multiple independent groups observe the same divisions within organisms in nature, maybe that means that species really are real. They're distinct groups. And so Ernst Mayer, who's the father of the biological species concept, which this is not, reports in 1963 going to New Guinea and looking at different species of birds. So in the Linnaean classification system at the time, they looked at 137 different Linnaean species of birds, and they found that there were distinct terms used by these indigenous people for 136 of them. So the local people who were in rare, if any, touch with Western civilization, basically, yes, identified exactly the same groups of organisms as other scientists did. So that was used as support for the idea that, in this case, species are real. What's perhaps more important, and this is, again, as it says up here, the basis for the recognition species concept. That's one of three we're going to talk about. 
I already mentioned the biological species concept. We'll talk about the definition of that in a minute. We'll talk about the phylogenetic species concept today. And then this is the recognition species concept. Do non-humans also recognize these divisions in nature? In other words, if you were a crow, do you distinguish your species from other species? That is, do crows know what different species are? Or do ravens know what different species are? Would this be considered um, a subdivision of speciation, or is that just like a human species? Okay, so is it human race? So is human race, are we subspecies? Are different races subspecies? What do you think? Probably not. Like maybe like varieties are morphs even. Okay, so now we got more terms coming. But yeah, exactly. So varieties, not, morphs, exactly. subspecies. There's some political connotations maybe to which terms we use. And we can sexually reproduce, so in reality we are all species. Yes. Fair enough. So we if any two humans were forced to interbreed and they had viable fertile offspring, then they would be called members of the same biological species. That tends to be true. Although there have been some interesting reports recently, I'll try to dig them up and share them with you, of reduced fertility, not completely eliminated fertility, but maybe reduced fertility arising between groups of humans, which might suggest that some populations of humans are coming down the speciation curve, which would happen over a very long period of time. What thing do we do these days that reduces the ability of different human populations to become different species. Yeah, exactly. So we've got global travel. So humans can, from one population to another population, can meet each other in any major city or small city around the world, for that matter. And that's a phrase that evolutionary biologists and geneticists call gene flow. That our genes move into other populations by mating. And the advent of basically air travel or fast boat travel means that the human population might currently be experiencing a lot of admixture, right? the blending of genetics and genes from different populations, sort of the melting pot idea of New York. That maybe there are distinct groups of, of populations of, of humans now. It could be that that actually becomes more mixed. But it is absolutely interesting to think about whether or not human populations should be or could be classified as distinct species, races, etc. So here's Ernst Mayer. Here's the actual written definition of the biological species concept. So this is his idea of one of the best ways to define species. So we're gonna, I'm going to show you the definition here, and then we're going to talk a little bit about cons, why this isn't maybe the best species concept. What are some of the problems with it, at least? So species or groups are actually or potentially interbreeding populations that are reproductively isolated from other such groups. One of the most famous definitions in evolution. Do you have questions about any of these terms that he uses? So I've tried to define briefly reproductive isolation. So any groups are reproductively isolated when a cross or mating between individuals of two groups produces inviolable, that is dead, or infertile, sterile offspring. Instead of just breeding. Just because I think maybe historically, just thinking about distinct populations, so not breeding within, but between, so inter population or inter group crosses. Why does he have to make the distinction between actually and potentially interbreeding? Because maybe species are still, certain species are still able to breed, even though they might be reproductively isolated in certain areas, but maybe not so much in other areas. Like a barrier or something might be removed and then they can still reproduce. Okay. Um, just pretty similar to what she was saying, maybe they could, but because they don't live in the same area, they don't. Okay, so yeah, it has, this, presumably, 
that. We don't know because Ernst Mayer is dead now. But presumably the idea was, yes, to accommodate the idea that two organisms might be geographically so far separate that they never would actually physically be in the same spot in nature to be able to try to mate. So that potentially aspect was presumably thrown in there to cover that situation. So this is one of the biggest problems with the biological species concept. I know lots of text. I should have thrown in some pictures. <clears throat> what essential population of living organisms does the biological species concept not help us figure out species definitions in? Think about kingdoms. So bacteria, fungi, so any sexually reproducing organism, especially bacteria, how many species of bacteria are there? Huge number of species of bacteria. But if they're asexually reproducing, right, a lot of bacteria, most bacteria reproduce by division. So they're clonal reproducers. It doesn't take two to tango with bacteria. A single organism makes a mother cell and a daughter cell divides in half. Right? That's how reproduction occurs. So how can you test whether or not two different bacteria are two different biological species? You put them in a petri dish, you play some soft music, turn the lights down, and then they reproduce by themselves. Right? They don't do sexual reproduction, so how does the biological species concept help us figure out which bacteria are from the same or different species? So the biological species concept is useful for sexually reproducing taxa, may be useful. Definitely not for asexual taxa. So aside from bacteria, fungi, what else does the biological species concept often not help us discuss? There are a large number of other organisms that asexually reproduce, or at least self. Yeah, so a lot of plants, yeah. The number of flowers. Although that's still sexual reproduction because of diffusion of sperm and egg, but if you are only reproducing with yourself, that still brings us to the same issue. If you work with a selfing plant, how do you know whether or not you're reproductively isolated with another plant that you think might be from the same species? Presumably this is where that one concept we just talked about comes into play. That potentially interbreeding. So even though it's a selfing plant, if you took some of its pollen and you fertilized by hand another sulfur and you produced seeds that were viable, then you'd say okay, these are two members of the same species, despite the fact that they don't actually do that process in nature. They can have viable fertile offspring and you call them members of the same species. So can you imagine what you have to do if you want to prove that two individuals are members of the same species. Imagine that this is in humans. So what would you have to do to prove that two humans were members of the same species? Right, so you check to see, so you put them in a room, turn down the lights, etc. They have offspring, so you want to know are the offspring viable and the offspring fertile. How long do you have to wait? Yeah. <laughs> For humans, right, so you have to wait at least nine months, but then after that's to know if they're viable. Right. How and long do you have, have to wait, wait until you find out that they're fertile? Right. Like 12, 14, 12, 14 16 years. Uh, nobody should do this, by the way. This is like, you know, do not try this at home. <laughs> Get approval first. But then, so there are some issues here. If you're working with a species that has a long reproductive cycle, long generation time, then how are you, you going to wait around to find out if these are two members of the same species or not? And then perhaps more importantly, if you mate two individuals and the first kid is sterile, and the second kid is sterile, and the third kid is sterile, how many times do you have to check to make sure that all of the offspring are completely sterile? Like what's the limit? There is none. I'm here to tell you today, but you could argue this. So you have to look at at least 10 offspring and show that at least 90% are sterile. 
you know, more arbitrary distinctions could be put in here, which is not what anybody wants to do, but it's just to underscore the idea that the biological species concept is nice in theory, but in practice it's difficult to use to actually define species. It's easier in some groups of species than others. Anybody have any questions, concerns, additional thoughts about the biological species concept, where it is useful, where it's not useful? So this has already come up both at the end of last class and also earlier today. And one of the biggest issues, what does it mean to be potentially interbreeding? So these two dogs are potentially, but probably not physically, going to be able to reproduce. But you could attempt in vitro fertilization and show that these are, in fact, members of the same species. They're two different morphs or varieties or populations of Canis familiaris, the house dog. So should in vitro fertilization count when we're talking about species concepts? That's what I was thinking. Right? If you have to do that much work? Yeah, if you think about it, I mean, in nature, right, they wouldn't be able to because of the size difference. But aren't there other, like, species that have actually um, adapted, like, a different type of sexual reproduction? Like, um, their, their parts are different so that they're not able to breed? Like, if that's a part of species. Indeed. But at one time, they were the same species? Right. So, it, yes, so it's, it's a fabulous point to make. In this case, we might be inclined to call these members the same species, in part because we know that they're recently evolved, they're both different versions of dogs. But there are species that have become physically reproductively incompatible, like this. Size differences, shape differences of genitalia, so that they are no longer able to reproduce. So what some things we do call species are physically reproductively isolated. They can't mate with each other physically. And then, yet in this case, if you invoke that potentially interbreeding clause and you do in vitro fertilization, you could prove that they're reproductively compatible. More gray areas. And again, I'm not going to try to tie this all up in a nice, nice neat package by the end of class today. I'm just trying to underscore some issues with how we define species. Here's another example. Here's the range of where you find white oaks, Quercus albus, in the United States. I guarantee you that if you take a white oak from Georgia, it's probably actually <coughs> reproductively isolated compared to a white oak in southern Maine. Right? There's no way that pollen from one is going to travel 2,000 miles up the East Coast and fertilize a white oak in Maine. Unless we do it, that in vitro fertilization. But this is exactly why Mayer put that potentially reproducing, potentially interbreeding clause into that species concept, was to account for these sorts of things. So yeah, trees might be on the, on the West Coast and the East Coast, but they could still be members of the same species, potentially. But this is still widely debated. Should we allow this sort of, th that part of the definition into what we define as a species? So is this one group of, is this all one species? What would we have to do if we wanted to define these as different species? just based on how far pollen travels, actual reproduction. What would we need to know about pollination in white oaks? Let's say we've got a white oak in southern Georgia. What would you do? What, what trees are going to be able to interbreed with that one white oak? Okay, so let's figure out, sure, let's find out how far pollen travels. So let's say the pollen from that tree will travel that distance. 
you either find out if it's windborne or if there's insect pollination, you find out how, the inse how far the insects can travel. So you could actually physically and scientifically define the range of pollination from a single organism. So does that mean that every oak tree within that circle is one species? No. Why not? Maybe the pollen is not able to, you know, be taken up by other trees or something. Okay, so, so it could be that there are different species of white oak in this circle that can't use that pollen. Let's assume they are. So there are a number of white oaks in that circle, and they all can trade pollen with each other and produce seeds, make more white oaks. But what about the second tree that's on the coast? It's a member of species one. But what's its pollination range? Presumably, it's about the same size. So it's reproductively incompatible with tree three. But tree three and tree and the original tree are so far apart that they're no longer actually reproducing. Now they're potentially reproducing. So maybe you start, hopefully, maybe it's a bad example. Hopefully, you start getting the idea that there's a gradient, that you can't choose a single individual and say, in, in, within a range, and define this specific group of individuals as members of its own species. Because at the edge of the range, that individual would yet be reproductively compatible with individuals geographically more distantly along, and so forth and so forth. So how would you ever define what a species is? Maybe if you get north of the Mason-Dixon line, <laughs> then we've got species B and species A. So you could use that as a definition, but the problem is there's a tree here and there's a tree there that are right next to each other on other sides of this boundary. So it could be that there's a continuum of ability to reproduce with each other for, across large geographical distances. It's hard to draw specific boundaries geographically that distinguish species. However, what is a type of a geographical boundary that we do often use to define where a species live? Or that, pardon? Mountain range. Okay, so mountain ranges. What else? Body of water. Bodies of water. What do these things do? Physically separate. Okay, so if you've got physical separation of, so for example, if you've got white oaks in the United States and Europe, then it might be easy to say the Atlantic Ocean prevents mating across that huge expanse of water. There are lots of cases where organisms are separated by a mountain range or a river or a lake. And those sorts of boundaries make it easier to describe what is species. I went over recognition species concept pretty quickly. That's just asking, does a crow recognize another crow as a member of its own species? For example. What sort of thing do you think you would do with a crow to find out if it thinks other crows are members of the same species? Go ahead. Is it attractive to them? Right. So basically, it's similar to the biological species concept. You put a crow in a room with a crow and a raven, so, and you ask which one does your vocal crow try to mate with? Does it recognize other individuals that member, as members of its own species by trying to mate with? So the, the recognition species concept and the biological species concept are related in that way. They both rely on some measure of what we can observe that tries to tell us, inform us about whether or not two individuals think that they're the same species. Both have to do with mating. And then there's the phylogenetic species concept. And I know your book talks about more species concepts. I want to note that there's a review in 2001 by Jody Hay that describes 24 different used species concepts in biology. Mm -hmm. So I'm just picking the, the main ones, but there are lots of other species concepts. And the last one I want to talk about briefly is the phylogenetic species concept. 
What do you think the phylogenetic species concept is going to do? Well, it could be based on DNA sequences. I mean, phylogenetic trees could be based on whatever characteristic we're interested in. Combination but, of different things, though? Sure. So how could you use a phylogenetic tree to define who is a, who are members of the same species and who is not? So the problem is, again, how do you define what traits are should describe different species versus different genera, versus different families, orders, kingdom, phylum, subspecies, human populations. So for example, here's a phylogenetic tree of human populations. This is all based on absolutely DNA sequence. So you get the mitochondrial DNA sequence of a number of human populations from all corners of the earth. Not, I know that there aren't corners of the earth. So the phylogenetic species concept definition, as it says up here, is an irreducible cluster of organisms that's diagnosably distinct from other clusters. Or the other quote, which maybe is a little bit more useful, the smallest monophyletic group of common ancestry. So I don't know if you can actually read these words. Oh, maybe they're pretty clear on the slide, if you've got good eyesight. What's a species of human, then, based on this phylogenetic tree? Smallest monophyletic group of common ancestry. What would you define up here as a species? I'm stumped. So where's a monophyletic group? OK. Yeah, so there's a monophyletic group, the San, a, an African population. It's not, it's irreducible, that is, there are no groups within it. It's a clade. So you could define, you could use the phylogenetic species concept to define this population of humans as a species. That's basically what the phylogenetic species concept says. Likewise, this clade that contains the Yoruba people and others could also be considered a different species by the, right? It's, it's almost stupid. You can use DNA sequence to distinguish my family as a different species from your family, because presumably I have passed on specific mutations from my genome to my kids that your kids don't share, or that your cousins don't share, or whatever. So. It, it's really difficult to figure out where do you draw the line, literally and figuratively, about how you use the phylogenetic species concept to define species. Up here at the top of the tree, let's see. You could consider that group that I circled in red at the top to be a species, except it's not irreducible, because there are groups within it including the Sami, English, Crimean, Dutch, and French. So maybe if you have ancestors from one of those populations, you're a member of a dis different species. Right? So what's a con for the phylogenetic species concept? Well, you need the technology to do it. Okay, so you need the technology to do it. So if you want to use the phylogenetic species concept on a group you're interested in working with, you have to have, you don't have to have DNA sequences, but they're very useful. Where could this help us? Where could this species concept address a deficit in one of the other species concepts we're talking about? Give you an idea of where um, two different species like um, diverged. Okay, so it gives you yeah, it can give you an idea of how how distinct species are, how far how long ago they diverged. Doesn't this help with the asexual reproduction? Okay. Okay, so with the biological species concept, you can't mate two bacteria together to ask if they're distinct species, but you can sequence their DNA and ask if the DNA sequences are different or not. 
So this is where maybe the biological species concept fails in some groups of organisms, but the phylogenetic species concept is more useful. So despite the fact that there are these huge number of species concepts, some of them have been used for very specific groups of organisms because that's where they're most useful. So you don't often see the phylogenetic species concept used in large groups of organisms, but especially sexually reproducing ones, but in bacteria, viruses, you might see the phylogenetic species concept used more frequently. In reference to the gradient, you could see that you could actually physically map out that gradient, like you were talking about with the white oak. Sure, so in, yeah, sure. In the white oak example, you could use the phylogenetic species concept to draw arbitrary lines or determine arbitrary thresholds of significance. So if you have more than 5% genetic differences between you, maybe you define that as two different species. Like an issue with this is that now we're increasing the number of species and uh, subspecies and varieties, and maybe that's where all those other categories came from out of the seven. Right. Should we? So that's an, an interesting point. This increases the number of species that we're defining. Is it important how many species there are on the planet? Some people would argue. Okay. So I heard probably not. Some people would argue yes. Okay. Are you one of those people? Yeah. Okay, so why would it be important how we define or how many species exist? Because you don't know what it could be useful for. I think that the amount of knowledge available could be useful now or at some time in the future. So, so you said that the amount of knowledge available could be useful at some point, by which you would... So you're arguing that having more species is useful because that means we've got more information about different organisms? Yeah, because think about mushrooms. If you didn't separate all the different mushrooms, you would have the ones that look alike, and you would say, those are okay to eat, and then you'd end up dying. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, so absolutely, good point. So mushrooms, yeah, if you don't have distinct species names for mushrooms that look similar, some of which are poisonous and some of which are not, that could cause some problems. <clears throat> Likewise, the number of species that we define can be used and I'm not going to take a stance on this, but for better or for worse with regard to I have to choose my words carefully. Mm -hmm. Conservation management or conservation and species management. So a, an example I like to throw out just because it's sort of locally or regionally useful is the delta smelt. Right? Small fish, lives up in the Bay Area, and it requires water to be diverted to it, presumably away from agriculture, to sustain because it's a federally threatened or endangered species. I don't remember which. Right. Who decided that it was a particular species? Right. So the more species, and again, I'm just trying to argue two sides of this. The more species we have, the more species are going to be endangered, presumably, because the more species we have, the smaller the number of individuals of each species necessarily will exist. The more you divert, the more you divide groups, the smaller necessarily the population size is going to be of each species. So maybe that means there will be more endangered species, maybe there will be reductio ad absurdum, but you can maybe see how that goes in terms of policy and management. So I think Personally, now, in my opinion, the biologists have to be very careful about how we define species because it has an actual real-world impact on agriculture, on our lives, on policy and management. There's one other issue with the phylogenetic species concept, which is only in that it doesn't necessarily play nicely with the biological species concept. So this just illustrates one case where... Reproductive incompatibility, the biological species concept up here at top, would recognize these two groups, B1 and B2, as members of the same species. So you, in this example, you take an individual from B1 and an individual from B2, they can have viable fertile offspring. But the trait of reproductive isolation, RI, has evolved here on that branch leading to population C. So population C, by virtue of having this new trait, is reproductively isolated or unable to mate with B1 and B2. So the biological species concept in red says B1 and B2 are members of the same species, 
species one, say, and that this group is reproductively isolated or a second species. But what does the phylogenetic tree tell us? If we use the phylogenetic species concept, which two populations would be members of the same species? B2 and C. So the phylogenetic species concept says that they're a population and that because B1 is more ancestral, it's a second species. So there are issues. Now, we can't say which one of these is better. Should you use the phylogenetic or the biological species concept? In either way, you get two species. They just don't agree. So the horses, donkeys, and mules example is a, the essence of the biological species concept. So you could imagine that. Let me switch back to red. So biological species concept. B2 might be a horse. C might be a donkey. So they're unable, they, if you mate them together, they make mules, mules are sterile. So that defines B1 and B, or sorry, horses and donkeys as different species. What would be a good example of B1? What's related to a horse that can still interbreed with a horse? And have, uh, I don't know, a maybe a zebra? Are zorses, you know, is a zebra <laughs> horse, are they sterile? Okay, so I need a better example to incorporate B1. Like a pony? Some sort of close relative of horses that are not donkeys and mules. This is where my organismal failings are apparent. I'm a geneticist, people. I don't know taxonomic difference. Okay, so I will try to figure out which organism we might consider B1 to be. But the point is that, yes, that's how the biological species concept works. So those two organisms are reproductively incompatible, but horses and some closely related species to horses presumably would still be intercompatible. They would be defined as the same biological species. And the phylogenetic species concept just looks at this, the shape of the tree. The closest relatives would be one species. More distant would be separate species. Other questions or concerns about the three species concepts? Recognition, biological, phylogenetic. We've talked briefly about pros and cons of each. How some are useful in some situations and other species concepts are useful in other situations. So hopefully this sets us up for trying to figure out how species actually form in the first place. So we're going to ask about how species form. What's happening here when the tree splits? When a single lineage of organisms branches? What's happening in nature at that point in the tree where the split occurs? So this is Darwin's only figure from the origin of species. Right? The first phylogenetic tree showing relationships between species. So what's actually happening in nature right there where one lineage becomes two? If you were watching, what would you say was happening? They became different enough to be distinguishable. Okay, so at that point in time, one lineage, wait a second. So they became different enough to be distinguishable. So you had one group of organisms, and within that group of organisms, say half of them were doing something that was making them slightly different from the other half. So the weird thing about phylogenetic trees and how we draw them is that it's a little bit misleading. So here's another making the exact same point, just with real organisms, not just Darwin's pencil drawings. Different species of Drosophila. So this is what they look like today. You can see differences, difference in banding patterns on their abdomens, differences in eye color, shape, body size. So what happens at each branch point? Maybe it's useful to think about speciation as not something happens at a particular instance in time, and all of a sudden, one population becomes two. What's happening in these regions 
is not an instantaneous split. It's more of a gradient, if you will. So multiple changes over time occur between the common ancestor and the subsequent lineages. So it's not that there's one magical thing that happens at an instant in time that makes one species all of a sudden, poof, become two. Isn't there proof in the fossil record of things like that, of like um, organisms that are kind of like in between? Right. So in fossil record, you look for transitory forms. So intermediate morphs or varieties of a population that, that seem to connect what exists at present and what a common ancestor looked like farther back in the fossil record. So what we're going to be talking about next class is what are those series of changes that occur between an ancestral group and two species that evolve from it. And all of these things occur to cause species formation. So it ha there have to be some differences. But they could be any type of these, any one of these classes of differences. There could be genetic differences that appear within a population that cause the population to divide into two. It could be morphological differences. That is, the populations like in Drosophila start looking different. Maybe that affects how they perceive each other as members of the same species. Behavioral differences, same story. Developmental, physiological. <clears throat> so what sorts of forces, and this is the last thing we do before next class, when we actually start talking about speciation. What sorts of forces prevent organisms from having viable, fertile, offspring. We've got two different categories. We've got things that happen before fertilization, pre-zygotic, before the formation of hybrid zygotes, and post-zygotic reproductive isolation, RI. So there are two different mechanisms of reproductive isolation, before fertilization and after fertilization. We've already talked about one pre-zygotic reproductive isolation mechanism. So if there's a mountain range or river that separates two populations, that physically isolates them, prevents them from mating, prevents them from making zygotes. Different mating point? Okay, so there's temporal reproductive isolation. If two organisms are reproductively active at different points in the year, then they'll never have the opportunity to have hybrid offspring. They'd be temporarily isolated. They could live at the exact same spot, but be fertile at different times. Um, maybe size of their population. Okay, so physical reproductive isolation. The dog scenario, there are lots of other cases of that. The Great Dane versus Chihuahua scenario, that is. So there could be physical reproductive isolation. No mating can actually take place because of physical differences between males and females of two populations. And there are a number of others that we'll go through more in detail next time. I want to make sure we've got a chance to talk about post-zygotic, just to get, there's two. What happens after fertilization that can cause reproductive isolation between two populations? Right, sterile and? Okay, so there could be some, there are more than two. So there can be genetic effects. So you could have mother and father, fertilization happens, the embryo doesn't develop because of genetic incompatibilities. But that's an example of, it's not sterility, it's hybrid. Right. What's the biological species concept? Two groups are reproductively isolated if they produce either infertile or inviable hybrids. So there's hybrid sterility and hybrid inviability. And hybrid inviability is what genetic incompatibilities is a part of. So there are two, essentially. Genetic incompatibilities is a type of hybrid inviability. So this is what we start talking about next class. The details of these types of reproductive isolation.